Yeah, I did. Perfect. Excellent. Um, and Nicole, are we uh, are we ready to record? Uh, yeah. In a moment. All right. So let me, as as, as I usually uh, say at these. Uh, at this point, uh, in a moment, I'm going to say that uh, we're recording, and that if you don't wish to be recorded, you should leave. Uh, oh, we got some background noise from somewhere. Maybe you could mute if you're not speaking. Um, so, um, uh, no, let me start that again. So, in a moment, <laughs> excuse me, it's been a long day here in the UK. Um, and so, uh, in a moment, I will we'll, we will start, and uh, I will say that we're recording this, and that if you don't wish to be recorded, you should leave. Obviously, we hope you don't leave, uh, but nevertheless, I have to say that for privacy reasons for the uh, recording that we're doing at, at, at OCAD. So, uh, with that, Nicole, would you like to start the recording? I'm recording. Okay, perfect. So, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 75th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Model Group. Uh, and uh, I have a few words of introduction as we normally do. Uh, we don't normally take att uh, attendance or get, uh, sorry, we don't normally uh, do introductions, but we do take attendance. Uh, so uh, at the moment, Nicole, our wonderful community animator, is busy asking you uh, to put your name and other details in the chat uh, so that we can add that to an attendance list on the wiki page for today's meetings, which Nicole will also put a link to in the chat and you can see who's here uh, and uh, get to know some of your, your fellow members. So, uh, let me see if I can get these slides working. So, um, Strong Sustainable Business Model Group, we're exploring how to enable entrepreneurs and established businesses to realize enterprises that choose flourishing as their goal. And that's the work of this global community of innovation practice since 2012. Um, and we like to start with an acknowledgement uh, of where we are and, and uh, who we're. Uh, where we are and who we are. Um, and so this is something that we've been doing in Canada as part of our truth and reconciliation process with the first peoples here in, uh, in Canada. And uh, we've now genericized it uh, so that it's applicable given we're a global community. So we just want to acknowledge that wherever we are today uh, on our planet, the sacred land on which we're privileged to be. And that land and the nearby lakes and sea have supported human beings for thousands of years and it's rich in history, knowledge and tradition. We're privileged to be the beneficiaries and stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and indeed beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect peoples indigenous to your place, including for many of you yourselves. And today, each place around the world is increasingly a home for peoples from across the world. And wherever we are, we are each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. And then in terms of uh, the place biophysically, uh, just a quick recognition, this is where uh, Nicole is, and uh, anybody else who's joined Nicole physically is uh, in downtown Toronto. Though it's uh, not a beautiful day, I suspect it's uh, a rather snowy and cold in Toronto, mm -hmm. if I understood correctly. Um, and so we just invite you to consider, do you know which watershed you're in today? And actually, I have to say that I don't, other than the Thames, but we are definitely sitting on a tributary of the Thames where we are here uh, in uh, northeast central London. So um, that's bad for me for not going and doing that. Uh, for those of you who are in Toronto, uh, you're sitting on an edge of a creek named, known as Russell Creek, uh, and that was buried in the mid 1870s, and uh, we're not entirely certain what its indigenous name is. We've been searching for it, but haven't managed to find it. Uh, and of course, if you use the bathroom around this session at all, you're using that watershed, you're using the ecosystem service, which uh, for one of the projects of, the flourish, uh, of the, this group, uh, the Flourishing Business Canvas, that's something that we can talk about in business terms. Uh, that uh, we can recognize how, how place relates to the business model. So I uh, wanted to let you know, we're now just over 400, and actually nearly over 460 people as of a few minutes ago, uh, globally, and we're perhaps the world's first or only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy to do organizations by natural research from a micro ecological economic perspective. So this is systems thinking economists, and we're doing this not at the macro level of the entire economy, but down at the organizational level, the micro level. We're using systemic design approaches in everything we do, and indeed today's presentation is a very good example of this. Uh, and we've got a strong normative purpose, which is to enable flourishing, strong sustainability, thriving, uh, whatever word uh, people would like to use that uh, means something to them. And of course, this means science-based and uh, using the best indigenous 
knowledge that we have, as well as obviously based on a strong uh, values-based idea of what we, what we desire, what we think is good and right and proper. Uh, we get you, uh, so we are, we are the right place to be if, you, if this is your perspective, and we're really trying to put into practice uh, the work that our members are doing. So increasingly we've got projects going on around the world with real businesses and real startups. Um, not going to go through this one. We are part of a, a large and growing movement, and that's a key element of what we're trying to do is to promote that. Um, and we are focused, yes, on the SDGs, but also going beyond the SDGs. As uh, Johan Rockstrom has pointed out so in the last weeks, um, when he started to talk about the planetary boundaries work that he's done, and Kate Rayworth's donut economics in relation to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. UN Sustainable Development Goals have got some significant problems. So we're going for the goals, but we're going beyond them as well. We've got a number of projects with our members, and I'm just going to quickly flash them up here. You can learn more about those on the wiki and uh, also uh, by visiting the project pages of all these projects. Um, and then we're also going beyond that. We've got a number of connections uh, to other things that are going on uh, in this uh, in this movement, um, including I just highlight the new business model conference, and I've got the number wrong there. It's number four, uh, in, uh, and I've also got the date wrong because it's now the beginning of July. Uh, so I need to fix that on this slide. So it's July first uh, and second in Berlin. Uh, and myself and a number of others are going to be running one of the tracks on open innovation uh, around new business models at that conference. Um, we also have the Reporting 3.0 conference coming up in Rotterdam the previous week. And um, again, we actually fixed the dates for the Systemic Design Conference because that's now happened. And that's going to be uh, in um, Chicago next year uh, around the same dates uh, as this year, but uh, in Chicago rather well, than this year it was in Turin. Uh, so, <coughs> We have monthly meetings. That's the biggest way that we share uh, on a structured basis. So this is the 75th meeting. And um, these are just some examples of things that we've done in the last month, including, of course, today's meeting. Um, we are uh, very keen to get graduate students engaged in with our members. And so we've got an ideas list of potential projects. And members can submit ideas to that page uh, if they're interested in trying to find graduate students to do uh, research. And obviously, from a graduate student perspective, it's an opportunity to engage with a world-leading, friendly expert community, to present research designs and get feedback, to engage with the community in field work, and to share final results and accelerate postgraduate employment. Uh, we also continue to need help. So at the moment, we are still a voluntary uh, organization, although stay tuned for details. Things, things are looking up in terms of uh, moving to a more formal structure, but uh, we'll have some announcements about that, hopefully. Uh, in the first quarter of next year. Um, but uh, if you are interested in helping to volunteer to help us run this, or you know somebody who might be interested, uh, this is an opportunity, as Nicole is discovering, to get inside the tent in terms of this uh, movement that we're building and to see and to meet all the people involved. Uh, we are looking for particular help organizing our monthly meetings and some other activities. And so if you've got some time, we'd be uh, please reach out to myself or to Nicole. So, with all of that introduction out of the way, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jan Desan. Uh, Jan is a professor of industrial design, uh, engineering technology at Ghent University. And uh, he and uh, one of his recent PhD students, Francesca Ostuzzi, uh, have been doing some amazing work on applying backcasting to product design. Backcasting being a key technique that we believe helps us get towards flourishing. Uh, and so, with that, Jan, I would like to hand uh, the presentation over to you. Uh, let us know how you would like us to deal with questions. Uh, do you want us to wait till the end? Would you take questions as we go through, etc.? Let us know what you would prefer. I could take questions in between, I think. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anthony. I will first try to share my, my PowerPoint slides to you. So before I start, so, but hello, you see my face, uh, but uh, you will see it also in my PowerPoint, I think. Is this shared in a proper way? Okay. Yes, I just... yes, it is. We can see that perfectly. Okay. I just am checking yeah, how to get the animation off. Okay. Um, I will take you in a flourishing design framework of change. We, in fact, I'm teaching already in industrial design engineering for some years. 
and let's say more than 20 years even. And one of the basic approaches we always had is that we would like to, to do design that is focusing on changing. And, on, and change for us is the real only way to become sustainable, to become in fact flourishing. And I would like to tell you some things about it amongst others, the PhD of Francesca, uh, which could not join us this evening, otherwise I would have asked her to present her PhD. Um, something about myself, so my main field of research is really, I come from the, let's say the production industry, in fact, I worked in industry and uh, that's why my uh, material and process driven design is still one of the focuses and then of course transdisciplinary research through design and design for change. Um, I'm also responsible for our education program on design uh, engineering and we are a member of the um, of some uh, networks of course but I would like to focus on my favorite quote which is I think that change is one essential phenomenon of life without change life simply stops do not fight change but embraces as a challenging opportunity it makes it not easy for us designers to design with changing environments, but it's essential, I think. And yeah, once you stop changing things, you stop life. Francesca is a, at this moment postdoc and she graduated, uh, let's say, uh, during uh, this year, in fact. Uh, she did her PhD uh, last year, I'm very sorry. Uh, yeah, we were already. 2018. Now she's um, operational as a postdoc and is focusing really on uh, sustainable development. And she's a member of our Center for Sustainable Development of our university. But she's also in the board of directors of a spin off that we made, Glimpse, which is focusing on biofabrication and is using um, all types of. Um, fungi in fact to to manufacture goods uh, we are growing materials by by fungi and so we are making a type of composite materials with it that's quite interesting and as you see also francesca is really focusing on change um the content of my talk but i'm trying really to get my powerpoint in place somewhere because I don't, I see half of the, the text and <laughs> maybe I try to rearrange it in a different way. Is this better for you? Well, for me it's better. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah. So I first like to talk to you about this design framework for change that we do at Ghent University. Uh, you will see that I will first start with a broader view that is not Kent University, but then we will talk about open-ended design, second order, cybernetics and multi-perspectivism. Um, and then we will look how this interrelates with new uh, business models. In fact. First, the design framework for change at Kent University. We are at a new era of design and um, we are at an era of design where we really are um, trying to solve very complex problems. We call it wicked problems. And a wicked problem, we find many definitions, but the one that I prefer is the one where we say it's a, a problem for which each attempt to create a solution changes the understanding of the problem. And if we look at sustainability, this is always the case. So the more solutions we find, the better we under, start understanding the problem. And what you typically see is <clears throat> that wicked problems always occur in a social context. So if we're talking about sustainability, we're not talking about the material context or solely, but really about interactions between different stakeholders. And the more complex the <clears throat> context of use becomes, the more interesting your wicked problem becomes. How do we solve wicked problems? Well, by always switching between uh, problem and solution space. It's a very simple model where traditional researchers are starting with a waterfall model, 
model where they try to define the problem better, gather data, analyze them, formulate solutions and implement them. We think that <clears throat> in fact, having a kind of quick switch between problem and solution space is the most important way to tackle that. And of course, what type of wicked problems do we want to solve? In fact, we really want to focus on flourishing uh, as uh, uh, flourishing as a methodology uh, to solve wicked problems. And we know that definition, I should not go in detail for that. I think, I hope you all know this and this is nothing new. What you see here on the picture is really our main university building in Ghent. I'm uh, at the campus in Kortre, but you see uh, now this, uh, yeah, this quote has been removed because they put a new quote and, and so on. But two years ago, on the, this was the quote that was standing on the main building of our university. So the next big thing that will happen will be a lot of small things. We believe that if you want to enable flourishing, you really can think globally, but you always should act in a local context and very locally. And you can do that because if you want to create a flourishing world, you have to involve, inspire and empower local communities, not simple persons, not people in general, but really communities that are believing in this. And that's why I like still this quote that was on our building and I kept this picture and I keep it also in my heart. I would also like to refer to the uh, Media Lab of um, uh, MIT, uh, which are doing a lot of what they call antidisciplinary work, but I prefer to call it transdisciplinary work. And uh, Neri Oxman really introduced that if we really want to go into uh, creativity uh, that we should follow a kind of a biological process or biochemical process called the grape cycle but it's the grape cycle of creativity where we really try to switch between different domains so we try to mix the culture of people or the, the human side and the nature side and really if you look uh, every domain is covered so if you, uh, you also will look at uh, perception and production. If you are in the quadrant of nature and knowledge you are, uh, and um, perception, you are in the science. And so science will convert information into knowledge. And then, of course, engineering will turn knowledge into a utility, uh, where you are, of course, in the production side. And then, of course, designers will turn utilities into behavior of humans. And then, of course, what do art people do is really convert behavior uh, into new information that we can capture where they are critical of what is happening and so on. And really going back and forth in this grape cycle uh, is the only way to continue in that. Um, Neri Oxman also made the second one, which I like also very much, because she's working a lot on different types of uh, materials. Uh, she is also working on really bio, uh, trying to mix the, the technical world and the biological world, and she is working on different scales. So, and she uses the same model, but she is really focusing then on the type of. Uh, or let's say production methods, which we could say are, can be biological. And if we are thinking biologically, we are trying to think in genes. And then of course, if we think about physical things, we are trying to think in atoms. And in the digital world, we think about bits. And if we are in the metaphysical world, we are talking about perceptors, which is a kind of human perception that we have. And this is also another view that you could look at. And I like very much uh, these images because they inspire me to think about design in a different way. Uh, also, Joy, Joy Ito um, of MIT Media Lab is now writing his PhD after some years as a director of the MIT Media Lab, 
but I put here some quotes on him and uh, what he says is in fact that we are evolving into a world where we will have artificial intelligence combined with human intelligence which get, can get augmented and why is that the best approach? Well, he believes that artificial intelligence is best at choosing answers. Uh, if we ask a question, you will get real better answers that we think we do, like for instance, diagnosing people that have a certain disease. And humans are best at choosing the right questions. So, and that's the creative process. And we really think by mixing these two, this would be interesting. And also another quote is that he really says, we must question and adapt our purpose and sensi uh, sensibilities as designers and components of a system for a much more humble approach. So we should be humble, we should uh, take humility over control and really lose, uh, let go our control and really give this really to the society. Another interesting uh, quote really is that we are not designing any more forms, but we are designing platforms because we have a complex ecology have unpredictable human interactions and emotional experiences and intangible services that uh, people want to pick off the shelf. And that's why we need, let's say we are entering a new era of design where we design the platforms. That's what brings me to the work of Francesca. And uh, this is on open-ended design. I will open her uh, PDF file, which was her presentation of um, um, in fact, uh, that she presented, so I will stop the sharing and open a new share. Um, so, I'm trying to fix this in the right way, share PDF. Are you all seeing this new document? Yes. Okay. So this was the title of the PhD of um, Francesca, and she said that she did an explorative study on how to intentionally support change by designing with imperfection. And really, the imperfection is very important because if we look, uh, imperfection means a never-ending story. And uh, if we look at design, design is a process of creation. So design is really an intentional act to modify a reality. And you see here the design of the Tower of Pisa. You, some of them are very familiar with it. And you see the sketch, this is what was made by the first architect. But if you really look at how it looks like, it's not looking as it was designed. So it's really, yeah, a little, it's very famous for being imperfect. And it's even, yeah, creating uh, a vibe even because it's imperfect, in fact. Uh, you can imagine that very well. Another example is, in fact, this was a an, an designer that intended with very good uh, intentions that he wanted to do something about drug abuse. And so he made a pencil, but look what happens if you use this pencil. So you see that it was not really communicated as was intended beforehand. So these are examples where we see that imperfection could either be, become iconic or could become really bad, in fact, in fact. And so if we think about design, we, as designers, we often tend to idealize the things because if we idealize the things, we design, let's say, in a virtual world with a, uh, computer systems and so on and this is an abstract model this is a stable model this is something which all designers believe have uh, have control over the whole system but if you really put these designed objects in reality and you make them concrete and rea uh, realistic they become dynamic and they become out of control and in fact yeah that's uh, some examples of uh, products that are imperfect and that came out of control. Some of them you will recognize very well, some of them you may not recognize very well, but I will pick out some of them. You see here the cup, well, it's not because the cup broke, uh, 
that we will not use it anymore. It might even be charming to use this type of cup and have it in your hand and it will be personalized. It will be your personal, become your personal flavor. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the negative side of it, so that you damage things due to the heat and so that the signs become unreadable and get destroyed. But this is a counterexample where we see that, for instance, uh, this is a mocha. It's really to make coffee. It's very famous in Italy. So, but if you buy it new, uh, no Italian wants to use it. They will only drink coffee after they have used it for, let's say, 10 times because they really want to create a patina of flavor of the coffee before using it in the proper way. So you need this kind of oxidation really to use it. This is another example. Um, this is a famous statue uh, in Verona uh, where they're trying to uh, touch Juliet people believe uh, if they touch this uh, statue that this would bring good luck and as you see due to the corrosion you immediately can recognize which parts to touch so it's very clear what you have to do with this type of statue and where to touch it if you believe in this uh, superstition. This is an example of reappropriation. So you see here a bicycle rack in, in Ghent. And so somebody thought that this would also be very useful for his canoe. So as you see, yeah, this is uh, uh, reappropriation of things. So if you look, products are emergent entities and are constantly interacting with their ecology, which could be human or which could be, of course, the environment uh, by corrosion or whatever. So the ideal parts which we design will, in fact, become, after a while, unique expressions of your product. So they will become ultimate particulars uh, due to using them in one way or another. And that we call, in, in fact, imperfection. Products are never fully fin uh, finished. They are ongoing, dynamic, emergent. And that's why we say they always have a kind of open end. Even if we don't like it, then we would design it as a fixed product due to the interaction with its ecology. It will always become open-ended and change in one way or another. In the positive or negative way, and this brings us to, let's say, the open-ended design. So the research that Francesca did as a methodology was really look at the role, value, and potential of change in industrially designed products. And she really did it as a kind of frame where she looked at the tree of knowledge, in fact. And the tree, if you observe it, it's a very nice thing you have, of course, you have the, the whole trees and you have of course the leaves and so on and so on and she did two research questions was was really how can the phenomenal uh, phenomenology of change be described so what she does then is really look in fact as at understanding how a tree works and uh, then you move the image to the right in fact and you see the whole structure behind the insights that you get and the second was really how can we intentionally support a change? And what you see is then the tree gets some leaves with examples. And if we have enough examples, we will understand how the tree works. And we will find also the roots uh, of this knowledge. And this was done, in fact, in these two research questions, was done by post factum observing products and by, in fact, ante factum trying to understand uh, the design process behind this and how we could use open-ended design. Uh, this was of course already expressed so that we have unique expressions and we really believe that these type of interactions that happen are a kind of conversations and these conversations could be conversations between the product and the user that we designed could also be between the user and the technology we use to produce this product it could be the user with other users, so kind of community, and the user with the designer. And this will all influence, in fact, the product emergence as it happens. 
And how do we co conversate? Well, first of all, we decide about the life of the product, which is very clear in the user product interaction. You see this pair of shoes, but what happens after, after a while is they are just dropped away and they, uh, they are just waste after a while. And what we really would like to do is, in fact, making products uh, last longing is completely different from making last longing products. So we don't have control what users will do with their products. They will just throw it away if we don't take care of it. And this is, of course, very bad. And that's why we really, as designers, have to look at, in fact, uh, how the product satisfies you. Because if it doesn't satisfy you anymore, you will throw it away. And this is a typical cycle. It's in fact the first arousal when you uh, haven't purchased it yet and the very short term where you're very proud of this product. You get excited in the short term and in the medium term you get in fact assimilated with it and your satisfaction will become less and you will feel that some things about your product are not good or in the long term maybe they even get destroyed or they get bored and they get disposed. Of course, this is true for regular products, but what about the shoes of your first baby you had? About these particular uh, type of uh, yeah, uh, shoe wear or uh, footwear, or these pair of shoes uh, that you use to go to a ball? Well, these you will not throw away. These get a higher emotional bond, and due to the higher emotional bond, they will lead to longer lifespans. And typically what you will see is then that the product will, uh, life cycle time will be prolonged and that you go beyond disposal. In fact, if you give a meaning to your product. And it's about this meaning could even be more positive. Think about the teddy bear that you have, the teddy bear of children, the, the more ugly it looks, uh, the more emotional it becomes, the more empathy the baby gets with it. So it's all about meaning, it's about empathy, curiosity, respect for the product. And this is really what we, we felt also, at least my parents and my grandparents, uh, they experienced that. They were very proud of what they had. They used their products even when they were already worn. And this is a complete different attitude. It's a flourishing attitude rather than yeah, the, the attitude of throwing things away in, in our throwaway uh, society. Uh, like for instance, uh, products will also improve by using them. These are uh, dancing uh, shoes, for instance, and the more you dance, the more they will adapt to your feet. So in fact, you even have products that improve by emotionally using them, in fact. And we call that ensoulment effect. And if you, uh, in, you get ensoulment by obtaining and accumulating meaning in time. This is very important, of course, if you really want to, yeah, to get attached to your products and don't throw them away. That's the first type of com conversation that has to be designed is the more challenging one. Then we have the user technology interaction. Uh, what we typically do if we look at the shoes that I gave as an example is really that we do mass production. But you have a design made to measure also. And some people are buying shoes that are made to measure. Really, you go to a shoemaker and you still can make shoes, a pair of shoes that fits you perfectly and that are made to measure. This is designed for one. And what we really believe is that the user technology conversation is really something in between there. So it has to do with the uh, variety. So if we are, in fact, at the left, we have more variety and the variety decreases if we go more to the right. And the volume of production will increase or decrease. And somewhere in there, this is a design paradigm so that we really want to keep an upscaled variety and still want to go for, let's say, some volumes that, uh, of production that we can adhere, in fact, to. 
And uh, design for one is the technology is very hard to spread because you really have to learn how to make shoes. But in the design for all, it's a very good technology, but it's very low fitting and it will not fit the needs that you really want. And of course, uh, we've done research on, let's say, like low volume techniques. We've done also uh, mass customization is a very known uh, criterion um, yeah making one with a very high volume this is doesn't uh, fit anymore and so what we really believe is that if you go to the long tail of production that you really become in this uh, gray area which you see in the graph and that we really believe that this is a very interesting zone for sustainable uh, development in fact uh, especially since we are using today new techniques like, for instance, 3D printing, but I will also tell you something about the biological uh, uh, things that we use. And you see that, of course, we can use this technology and here you see an overview. Then, of course, you have the distance and technology between the producer and consumer which is very long distant in this kind of standard products that you buy buy in fact as consumer but the more you get connected to each other and the more you get interaction with between producer and consumer and the more you become consumer and producer maybe the more interesting your in fact your conversation becomes and the more interesting and more sustainable your conversation becomes and the more meaningful your design will become a uh, user Users, other users, in fact, can inspire you. So you will design your first product. And so once you use it, an end user uses it, it will get reappropriated. So you will give it another meaning. You will use it in a different way as it was first designed. And if you have more end users, you will get more reappropriations. One site that uh, delivers that is for instance instructables.com where you can upload your instructable to make a first design and where you see then people change that and comment on it and change the product again and make it let's say ultimate ultimate particulars of the same product and this is something that happens and so on um, data transformation is also very important in that so and that we in fact what we do then is the conversation between the user and the designer and normally the designer will look at the end user as an object but if you look at your user as a kind of co-designer that can really express the feelings and the emotions that should be aligned with the product you become not a simple user but your conversation will focus really on the co-design and so these are the typical out of control conversations that we typically see and we believe that in fact this can be associated with the imperfection of products and one imperfection that is very ancient that uh, is in a culture is uh, the japanese culture of wabi sabi where they are really uh, trying to make artifacts and art with these imperfections and they always change it from day to day and they will uh, see the, the evolution and, and use that. You see another example here. So in fact, uh, Japanese Wabi Sabi really says that the change in time and use is a way to look at the product as beauty. So it's an aesthetic, uh, not as an aesthetic quality, but as a kind of a healthy product to made to be used in fact and that's what the japanese culture is about and that's what we believe also that product should have and that's why we are so focusing on the change itself a very famous example of wabi sabi that we know today is wikipedia which was very imperfect in the beginning and still is but it's uh, yeah it's very much more powerful since you share it in a, a whole community worldwide. It becomes yeah, a, a thing that is very interesting. So and then we think that the ways to, to
to think about this design process is in fact conversations, as you see here, and we don't believe that you need to focus on one conversation, but really on all type of uh, conversations, and then we arrive at system thinking. I will not go into further detail of the whole process and research that was done. I will just give some examples. This is a, a real nice example about incremental houses. So what you typically see is that uh, in, uh, if you uh, typically, after you had a disaster, you're building these kind of uh, quick villages and what people do is that they will leave these houses very soon if you did, uh, built them but if you build half a house and you let the people uh, change it according to their proper needs what you typically will see is that people will build half of the house themselves and change it as you see here they will make an extra entrance or a terrace or they will uh, change it in a different way and your house becomes very personal you see a garage you see a nice entrance you typically see in fact by making unfinished or open-ended products, people would, will adapt things according to their needs and you will make a standard part and on the other hand, an open-ended part. This is another example. It's an example where you have a terracotta uh, um, plate. So, but if you drop it, uh, it will not break uh, so that you can't use it anymore, but you get other objects which you can use again as different type of plates or whatever smaller plates that you can still use. So it's uh, designing a second life. This is used of often also. Uh, this one is also very interesting. It's really about corrosion. So what you typically see is that this was in fact a kind of pattern with a corroded uh, uh, um, patina that you see. But if you move, you really get traces and you really see the route to follow. And this becomes beautiful. So by the wear becomes a kind of art piece in fact. So it's by leaving traces in time and use that you can get imperfection, but which is more beautiful. Sugru is also a very nice thing. It's a kind of plastic that you can really uh, form in any shape and that you can use to repair things. As you can see here, uh, it's really to repair this connection. But as you see, it's endless, so it's completely open-ended. Everybody can make whatever they like, so they can make an organization system for cables, or they can use it in the kitchen to organize things or repair things and so on. So it's so open-ended so that you can use this Subaru as a material, in fact, and shape it according. So by repairing and hacking, you can make it, give it new meanings. This is another example. You see this washboard and, and, and a kind of Carrara marble, marble, in fact, but what you typically see is that what was cut out is this piece, and you can use this at a, as a cutting plate. So what you typically see is what was used, used to be waste can now be used as a kind of uh, yeah, cutting plate which you can put on a, with a hook somewhere on a place. But this was really, in fact, not meant to be like that. This is just the, the path of manufacturing of this, uh, uh, yeah, this, uh, this uh, marble plate that you saw. And what you typically see is that this is not waste anymore, but that really that the waste has been transformed, uh, the scrap has been transformed in something useful. These are the type of things now, I just want to arrive with one thing that is very important there, is really that we really want to observe this change and if we want to make some things open-ended, this is the way to do it. So we are observing the product and we've made 10 lenses on these products and that's why is the product changing? Who is making the change? What in fact is, the, is this as a result of a deliberate act or not? Uh, when is it happening? How fast is it happening? Where does it happen? 
uh, how many products can be made with the thing. So what's the scale of production? What's, what is changing? If I change, uh, how much is it changing? And is the change reversible or not? Some are, some are not, some are reversible. And these are nice observations to make really if you observe change and use that as a design paradigm. What we've seen is that uh, we've done some tests with students and they really can uh, put these lenses on existing designs and they can reappropriate them and change them in a way so that they can evolve it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly yeah. yeah. A, question, a question about the list of 10. Can you just go back to the list? Yes. So, um, is, is your um, thinking that that is a complete list? No, it isn't. But it, we saw that it works and that it's very much context dependent. And we saw that it's not um, that some of them are dominant, in fact. Some of these parameters are dominant. Uh, why, for instance, a product becomes obsolete or why it gets better in time. In fact, and that observing this is very important. Another thing is that the things that you leave open, you don't have to put effort in manufacturing them in the right way or whatever. Mm. But uh, Francesca researched that and she came to these 10 lenses and they work very fine. So I would not say it's limited list, but until now it works fine as we have this model. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So as you see here, yeah, this is in fact, again, uh, this type of changes that we looked at. I will not go in depth of these projects and all these data. Uh, I want to come here. So that's in fact, what do designers do with this product? And that's this scheme is in fact, what we first do is we design in a proper way, a product as we used to have, and this is not open-ended. And what we will do is try to observe how the product evolves in time and becomes, in fact, imperfect in time. And this is done through these 10 lenses and we try to understand what happens. Yeah, so that are the 10 lenses. And of course, as we said, we say some changes are uh, unavoidable. And if we leave these changes that are unavoidable unavo open, this means that we need less resources really to realize this product and that we are yeah, working in a more sustainable way, in fact. And these contextual attributes are really identified by these 10 lenses. And we try to do 10, in fact. Yeah, we try to make a kind of new hypothesis. And this new hypothesis will increase the meaningfulness of the product and so what we will do is we will open up some perspectives as you can see here. And so we try to anticipate on it and then look how it behaves again. So what we will have is that this product will evolve even further or change even more or less. And so what we can do is test this hypothesis by observing again. And so we start the next iteration of this observation. And so we really, always do let's say like uh, observe again iterate again on this context and that's the way we do it that's her phd so, more yeah, or less summarized yeah yeah, yeah. could you just go back to that the, the last uh, the last chart there is that possible yes uh, well let's look i think it's about 150 somewhere It's a lot further. My, 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 so when I first this one, that, yes, for example, yes, or, or even the very last one of, of the series of, of, of talking about the method. So, so when I first saw this, Jan, yeah. what, what crossed my mind was that this is a type of backcasting. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I don't think that was a term that you or Francesca really used um, uh, around this. And I'm just curious to hear you talk a little bit more about this, um, this anticipation 
of mm -hmm. how you think the product or how the designer imagines the product will be in the future. Um, yeah, we've done some tests with, with our students, so which are bachelor or master students, and we really gave them an assignment and we really said, okay, now you see that this product is changing in time. And you observe that and really try to anticipate and redesign it. And this is what we do, in fact, in, in courses. We even say, okay, you have a first course where you design this product, for instance, yeah, and then at a certain moment, yeah, they have to finish that and they have to observe what, what users are doing. But I will give you some examples later maybe of that in my own slides, so because I will show some student examples. So, so, so for example, does, does that, that observation include imagining the emotional response to a product, how that might be yes. different in the future, you know, where, where people's values have changed? That's it the value change because you get more emotion to it and you really try to predict. The only thing to do that is by making prototypes. In fact, we, we're prototyping everything. We're looking at the behavior. We're prototyping even yeah, the open-ended product and we look how people react to that. And it's the only way it works, in fact, because it's the only way where you really understand what they are doing. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but I will go back to my PowerPoint. Um, I think I will stop sharing and share again my PowerPoint, which is, yeah. I hope it's not closed yet. Yeah, it's somewhere here. Okay, so this was the uh, PhD of Francesca. I summarized here some things of her PhD again. So it's designed for imperfection, which we think is very nice because it shows that imperfection is beauty. And in fact, change in time can be beauty if we think about it in a flourishing way. Uh, it all changes us, uh, experiencing things changes us. As I said, yeah, products are emergent entities because they constantly interact with their ecology, with their environment. And of course, this is a repetition of what she was telling. In fact, it's uh, uh, the meaningful imperfection, the system. And here I would like to add, in fact, some fabrication methods that are focusing a little on this area where we are doing research right now is really on the digital manufacturing platforms with 3D printing, but where we are doing this in a sustainable way. So we close the loops, so we even are uh, shredding waste, plastics, uh, and then we extrude them in wire, and then we can manufacture with that new products and so on. Uh, this is a research that is ongoing. Another is on biofabrication, as I, told you we are using mycelium, which is a kind of fungus, in fact, um, to make composite materials and doing biofabrication. But uh, next year we will do a similar project with uh, the cocoons of silk. So we will put them, uh, they've done that also in, in MIT Media Lab, so uh, Neri Oxman did that already. But we would like to make textiles with it. So instead of while well, weaving the silk and, and producing it and so on, spinning it and weaving it and, and doing, we would like the, the cocoons move over a 3D printed structure. And we would like to look uh, how they, by putting food, in fact, in these structures, we hope that they will make like, say, like a t-shirt or whatever in silk. So we would like to do this experiment. It's change in time. It's really, uh, you will never get the same t-shirt. Will, you will always have unique pieces. The same is true with mycelium. If we produce it, it's a kind of fungus that is growing. And we put it in a mold, but it's never perfect. It's always somewhere different, somewhat different. And yeah, it takes you like three weeks to produce it. So even you have to take care of it. It's like you would have plants and take care of it and putting it in the environment. And at a certain moment, we want to stop growing it. And then we put it in an oven at 120 degrees and it stops growing. And you really get 
a lightweight product because all the 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 humidity is has gone and it's a composite material that is very lightweight and where we can design products and we've started this uh, company glimpse with it and yeah we are doing this type of research on biofabrication so we believe that we don't need perfect products which are within a certain tolerance or whatever but we believe that if we let products grow in a natural way you will get imperfection but this imperfection is really what we really want to do with these type of new techniques in fact so that's something which we are focusing on uh, we are really also focusing on mass customization for one so not just five variants but really completely personalized we are also thinking about uh, mass customization and repair so we are thinking about 3d printing as a repair uh, tool and so on and uh, our students it's one of the things projects is on repairing headphones and so on so they're working on that this is a, a model that i presented at a conference uh, yeah yeah and so, sorry can we just go back to that that previous chart yes. um, so um obviously the, the classic economic view that we've had in in industrialized society yes was to go to the top right corner of that chart. Yeah, and, and we don't we, want to do that. That we don't want to do the stuff in the grey box. So, yeah. are, are you are you suggesting? Earlier on, you made a comment about localization and, and doing things locally. Yes. Um, so, so, are you suggesting that the grey uh, box is the a better combination of of local effectiveness as opposed to global economic efficiency? Yes. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, but it, here we are only talking about user technology, but we are also talking about, um, yeah, as I told you, the consumer becomes a co-designer. Right. We even believe that some things will be done at home or in fab labs or in repair stores or whatever. We are now also looking at 3D printing and textiles and so on. We're combining 3D printing to repair clothes, for instance. So we have a repair shop and we can repair clothes of children which have uh, been torn off and which was damaged and so instead of suing them and making it let's say a little bit old-fashioned and, and not nice uh, they can print on this textile and they can make like yeah let's say a butterfly or whatever so that children like and so that it becomes a kind of toy and it becomes a kind of obvious that you can use these techniques so that are the type of things that we believe it's really about the conversation between the user the end user and the technology it's really about that that we are focusing it's not anymore the designer that is deciding who is making the product and how it's made it's really we really want the user to use this and we really want to offer the technology and the knowledge how to do this as i said with biofabrication you could have a mold and you get this mold but then you get also your mycelium and you really let it grow and after a while let's say after three weeks you have your shape as you you have designed it and you look at it and you can then put it in the oven and then yeah it's finished and you decide yourself when you want to finish it or whether you want to continue it to grow or whatever it's also biocompostable, so you put it just in the compost and it will become just again, yeah, food for the next cycle or whatever. Yeah, so it's this type of ideas that we have in production, in fact. This is the model that I am always trying to describe. It's really what is a system. We think that the system is always a product in interaction with an activity or an, an interaction in a certain environment. And typically what you will see is that uh, you have the virtual or ideal world which you design. And then if you interact with the ecology of use, uh, your product will become open-ended and evolve in time. And this is the physical world. And typically what engineers want to do is they want to make this product reproducible. And so they put a lot, in, a lot of effort in making it reproducible. 
what we say is if you add to that open-ended strategy, you will have emergent properties. And what we are not saying is that you don't need any controlled environment where you can control nothing about your production parameters, but that you have to put more emphasis also on the emergent properties which are open-ended and which lead to imperfection and which lead to change. And this is in fact what we would like to address with this model and that's a new way of looking at this model. And as I said, yeah, the conversation is also very important. And this is a model of Pangaro, which I like very much in fact, where they say, okay, uh, you have to make a conversation to create a new language between the users or users you have to conversate on to agree on goals, uh, to agree on the means of your goals, to agree on uh, to design uh, the designing. In fact, and this is a process that you will iterate on and that you will reach in the end. How do you prototype this? And this is important, as I said, uh, if we really want to observe it through our lenses, we first have to prototype the real life experience. And what this is a very simple uh, scheme that explains that you not only uh, prototype your object of study, but also your activity or interaction and your environment. And in fact, you can do this, of course, at a very abstract level with models, but you can do it in the real world. You can, for instance, your context could be the real local people that using that, but it could be like in a living lab, or it could be like uh, with some uh, um, consumers or with a scenario that you write or, and make a film out of it. Your objects could be very functional uh, prototypes, but it could be just work like or look like prototypes. It could be multiple prototypes where we test with. And the activities could be real interactions. Um, and the way we test it is in fact, uh, either uh, that's the other dimension from the outside or from within. And from within, we really, as designers participate and we co-experience with the users and we make a real conversation with them through these prototype uh, solutions. But you can also do it from the outside and observe just uh, by the, using, for instance, the lenses and looking through uh, uh, at interact, the interactions or uh, even learn without the interaction. So, but really, yeah, from the outside is more looking yeah, from a distance, which helps you sometimes you have to do it because if you get completely involved, you don't see the things that go wrong. But from within, it gives you the empathy and it really gives you the, the co-experience to understand what people really feel and what are the emotions and so on that coexist. And really, we think that whatever system you're designing, you're designing an evolving system and ever, it's a prototype on its own. So really observing this in time can help you. And it's, uh, that's really the model how we learn our students to work with. We say, okay, every product is a prototype of the next one, in fact. And that's what we do. Another thing we are focusing on, but I will have to speed up because I see the time running. It's uh, that we are also using second order cybernetics. I will not go into detail too much, but what we understand under second order cybernetics, if we look at a single loop adaptation, uh, we see that the, the goal or the problem space remains the same and we try to find a new solution or another solution or evolve in time. Uh, within the same space. If we do a double loop adaptation, we see that we go to another level and that we also change, in fact, the goals. And that we call the second order cybernetics or the double loop adaptation. And I think the figure above shows it very well. Either you remain in the same search space, either you change your goals. And in fact, if you really want to make sustainable products, uh, uh, long-lasting products and long-lasting last, experiences, you really have to change your goals because people evolve in time, have new interests and whatever, and this is the way to go, in fact. 
We are also using causal loop diagrams to understand uh, the complexity. I will not go into detail of that. And we use uh, this analysis, we use some archetypes where we really want uh, to see what's happening. So your goals drifting away, fixes that fail, so limits to your success, uh, boundary effects, things like that, tragedy of the commons and so on. What's important in each of these archetypes is that, in fact, um, is delay. So you change something and only after a while you see the change, in fact. If you uh, change your environment, for instance, only after 10 years, maybe you see the impact on it. Uh, so, and that's very difficult to observe. And we train our students to really think on these archetypes and on these delays so that they can predict what will happen in the future and that they make models out of that. This is an example, a student case that I would like to show you. It's in fact where we did on our campus a test on how to stop food waste at our campus. And uh, this is a movie that um, is showing what it happens. This is really in a, yeah, the restaurant. This is of course a typical Belgian thing. It's not the most healthy food they're showing here. But uh, they're throwing away their food waste. They're putting it in all in the same bin as all the rest. And what you typically see is that they did some tests for food. They even can ask a smaller portion. And this uh, reduces the food waste at the beginning, so I'm not so hungry. Give me a smaller portion. And so they can ask for that instead of our standard food. Then they are also doing food sharing, which is very nice. So they have, for instance, two apples as leftover. They put it on the Facebook group, stop food, food waste. And they say, who else wants to have a, a new... And uh, this was a project of uh, 2018, uh, second semester, so we finished this in June. But right now our restaurant is really running on this new food waste system where we reduce the food and then we sort the food. And the second is really where this Facebook group is working very well at, at the campus, and where students often have leftovers and are sharing this food amongst themselves. This is a very nice project, as you see. But how did they tackle that or how did they look at it? Well, they just designed, they used time as a designing parameter. And what you typically see is here, the number of observations that they did. And so in each observation, they did the change of prototype. And typically what you see in time uh, is that more people are trying to sort the food correctly uh, people, how many people looked at the signs? Uh, here you see a big increase in the signs, and after that they don't look at it anymore. But they know the system, so you don't. They don't look at the signs anymore because you don't need them anymore. But you typically saw that the students were using, in fact, uh, the system in a correct way. Uh, that there were very little errors. In. Another uh, thing of our university is really that we we'll do a lot on multi-perspectivism. It's really one of our education basic things. And we really want to let uh, students more participate actively 
towards critical thinking, ethics, and active participation into society of today and the future. And I'm also teaching a course on that, which is called co-creation, where they really have to design for communities. And uh, that's, in fact, the goals that we would like to, to adhere. One of the things that we're focusing a lot on is on diversity. You must realize that Ghent University is a general university, so we have faculties like engineering, arts, um, law, um, economy, but um, uh, biology, uh, veterinary, medicine, all types of things that we have, psychology, uh, education, whatever. So we have 13 faculties. It's a very yeah, huge thing. And this is an elective course for the whole university. So, and we are training them in this type of co-creation things. And we're doing this together. For instance, uh, we learn design thinking, in fact, where we try to zoom in on, on specific focuses. But of course, Everybody has a different perspective because they have different education and they really iterate between the problem and solution space every time. And they have to use this type of model where you see this system again, but you system of products with a system of activities where we call communities and a, a context or environment with uh, is approached from multiple perspectives. And this model works very fine and I've done this course, let's say now for the second time and I will show you some results of the course. The first was the development of a reminiscence game for people with dementia. You see here the, the, the a tool, it's a game. Uh, normally what they do in people with dementia, they train them with reminiscence, so it's kind of remembering things from the past, but they do it only with the people that have dementia. This game allows you to really play, in fact, this game also with your relatives. So for instance, with grandchildren or with other people. And so uh, they start communicating and it's a good way to communicate. And they play the game, you see here some uh, people playing this and they have to do some, um, yeah, some things. So when they arrive at a certain place, they have, for instance, to take a, a bottle and they have to smell something and they have to tell, what do you smell? Or you show a, a personalized pictures of the family. You show a family picture, let's say of 20 years ago, and you ask who is on that picture, what do you see? Or they see, for instance, Elvis Presley or whatever. You can ask to these people, who is this? and they start talking. And that's in fact helping these people with dementia to overcome that. But that's also a way to let the grandchildren communicate with their grandparents. And this is very nice and this is now tested in a lot of care centers in Belgium. You see here how, what was the design mo model. In fact, it's an adaptable open-ended game because you can add your own pictures, you can play it. It's just the rules that are the same and they just, uh, yeah, the chances that are played. It's in fact making a connectivity to be between persons with dementia, caregivers and family. And it's applicable in many co uh, convalescence home, in fact, and it's played uh, and it, now it's being commercialized. This was a business model that one of our students developed and they are now going to the market with it. So they are starting to commercialize this. Another is really a completely different context. It's an anaerobic digester for city communities. So there are city gardens in Ghent and in a very special community. And typically they have a lot of uh, organic waste and uh, they, instead of uh, digesting it in an industrial environment, they made a DIY solution, which you see here on the picture, where the people can build themselves. You're talking about communities that are poor, which are very diverse. Uh, you see here, it's um, an area where a lot of people come from, from abroad and they're yeah, uh, living together. Typically, you see here the, the, the gardens, uh, the city gardens that they are using. 
and the partnership and they are stimulating this neighborhood and upgrading it and people are growing their own vegetables and they're even making a vegetable party and things like that due to these digesters they have a, a, a multicultural environment and then you typically see our students here which are training these people how to use this and they are learning how they can make these kind of digesters in the gardens themselves in the city and so for them it's it's very crazy and right now they are still using this type what you typically see is that the system of products is really a diy context with local resources is designed by and for the community and it's really in a very local environment which is very cultural uh, uh, dependent and so on this is a third example. It's uh, uh, something also for elderly people. So it's a kind of online service that provides personalized coloring pages to elderly. Relatives can take pictures uh, and they can upload them in an app or website and convert them into coloring pages and send it to the elderly. And then the elderly can color it. And what's, uh, it helps, in fact, to have a positive impact on elderly that are in care centers. So you typically see that focuses like, for instance, uh, how can we improve loneliness? What will we do? Keep into account. Um, how will we increase contact with families? Uh, how will we empathize with them? And these are the added values of the game. So they stimulate the creativity of the people. They color in activities and groups, so they can tell about their family because their family members are on that. So it stimulates also uh, the communication. It stimulates also the motoric, motoric skills. Uh, it brings back memories. For instance, they couldn't be at the wedding of their grandchild, uh, but they really have the picture. They can put it in their room and so on, and it trains again the reminiscence. This is how the app was developed. You see here the, the different steps. One of the things that's interesting is that they can choose the level of um, motor, uh, motoric. So they can choose from easy to difficult. And this is, of course, this is the example. And then they can tag people in it. They can send it. They can, of course, uh, deliver it and so on. And then this is the, the company, how it works. The design model here is a digital environment and an online printing service. And the system of activities is connectivity between relatives and also the activity of coloring with caregivers and residents of the care center. And the context is the care center context, but also the family context, which is, brings, of course, the people that are in isolation within, let's say, your holidays uh, pictures or within a wedding or uh, uh, a child that has been born or whatever so you can bring old memories to those people this brings me to the second part which we think how open-ended design and business model innovation interrelate we believe that there will be a paradigm shift from life cycle to adaptive change the classical life cycle we know where you introduce a product in the market it grows matures and it declines and so this is also uh, a model where we are using uh, primary resources and consuming them and throw them away at the end. Uh, the second, uh, the business model that they use for that is the classical business model canvas. Uh, we know that. Then we see the paradigm shift towards, let's say, more a circular model, uh, where we really try to reuse resources in a biological circle or a technical circle. And for that, you could also use the flourishing bus uh, business canvas. There is also more than that. Uh, you are also looking at the environment and societal properties. But we think that you could add a third dimension to that. That's in fact the emergent evolution and adaptive open and the change, where we believe that uh, by perceiving values as empathy, curiosity, respect, meaning, we can improve the, the life of products. We will change products rather than throw them away. So we'll adapt them in time. 
And we believe that also the companies have to adapt in time. So it will never be a static um, model anymore of a business model, but it will be an evolving business model that is changing in time and that is imperfect and that is open-ended and that will evolve in time. And other things that we believe in, that's also mentioned in one of the papers of uh, uh, Joy Ito, is really about the multiple currencies. Uh, often this is uh, used in biology uh, to interact amongst organisms. I will give the example of the bee and the flower. So the currencies that they exchange is that, of course, the flowers offers, let's say, the honey to the bee. And that, of course, the bee takes the, pol uh, the, the, the pulse and will do the pollination to go to another flower. So these are mul uh, uh, yeah, mutual currencies uh, of mutual values of meaning that increase this. And in nature, it's full of these things. And we believe that using not one currency, just money, uh, but using other currencies like values, like uh, knowledge, not like uh, involvement, like engagement and so on. They should be currencies that we should take into our models and that will lead to adaptive change. And then, of course, uh, another thing is that we can look at the emergent behavior by anticipation and observation. And so we believe that if you design a product and bring it to the market that by uh, observing it and look through lenses through it, you will anticipate and change it in time, over time, and look at the behavior again, and so that you will not put up a whole production line that produces in mass products, but that each product will be changed in time and will be imperfect, but will evolve. We could even let users make products uh, in biofabrication or whatever. And that means, yeah, of course, that we are more um, operating in this low uh, thing. So if you look at the business model canvas, you have the production side. Well, we believe that this could be done also by users in a natural process and digital processes in a mix of both. And really believe in, in things like we copy the product, we copy and transform the product or we copy, transform and combine the product with another product and we let it involve. And so the scaling of production becomes very crucial in that. And so what you see typically will see is that your flourishing business canvas could become an open-ended flourishing business canvas that evolves in time that will look at emergence that will look at how you use that and yeah at yeah unexpected events to happen and how do you react to that and and, and yeah i would like also to make the analogy with uh, nature where sometimes of course um we think that companies have a, a life and the life is uh, and is not endless it's it's short in fact but we believe that like for instance in a colony of bees or of, of ants or whatever uh, it's it's really the rule of the ants that determine that uh, the whole colony becomes strong and the all everybody gets a role and interacts and has other types of of, of, of things that they have to do and one of the roles is to create offspring so that your colony remains. But one of the things that's also interesting, for instance, with ants is that they have a limitation to growth. So you will never find more than 10,000 ants in one colony. If they become more, they will make a new queen and they will start just a new, uh, yeah, new colony, in fact. So nature limits the growth and copies and really changes and the company is changing all the time and creates offsprings. And we believe that this is the future to think about. It's really companies that are using, and of course, if you look in seasons, yeah, you become, let's say, you start in spring, summer, autumn, and then in winter you die, but you die just to create new life and to create a new company and to create let's say a flourishing, more flourishing thing, and in winter time, you're putting your lenses 
and you're really thinking what you can improve and it's like in nature then the soil becomes good or it's when we sleep we are storing all the memories of the day in our brains or whatever so this is i think the, the message that i would like to bring to you thank you so, thank you yeah that, that's uh, that's all very inspiring uh, and, and you can uh, if you take a look at the chat you can see there's been some uh, thanks and commentary and appreciation in the chat uh, I was just wondering, um, does anybody else, I've asked a few questions as we went through, does anybody else have any uh, questions or observations? Yeah, I've got one. Please, go ahead. Yeah, no, um, I, I need to apologise, I need to leave quite soon, but I've really, really enjoyed this talk. You know, there's um, a lot in common with the way Maria and I work. Uh, you know, we very much take a hermeneutical phenomenological approach. And we also work with Goethe's phenomenology, which really brings, you know, I really liked the start of the presentation as well, where you really looked at living processes. So, you know, I, I'm very much aware of time. So what I've said is um, I'd love just to share a couple more links on the LinkedIn page, you know, for this particular lecture, you know, I'll share a little bit about our framework because also we take a kind of a transcendental approach to um, phenomenology, and this allows us to really look at being, truth, goodness, and beauty in um, a quite elevated way that's very engaging for business leaders. And um, last week, um, I received permission to share some further photos, which um, we haven't really been able to share before, so um, I'll um, add some links on the page as well, as when they, as when I publish the photos. But no, really, uh, just something excellent talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Jan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was, I was wondering, Jan, might you share um, a little bit about where uh, you're thinking that this research uh, agenda that you've been developing over, I think, many years now, where, yes. where, where do you see it going next? What's the, what's the next questions that are on your mind that you, you want to try and, and uh, answer? Well, I really think sharing is the first thing, yeah, because sharing knowledge, we, we've seen that in our, let's say, our micro environment or that we are working on uh, with our local environment. If you look at uh, the companies that are in the neighborhood, some companies are picking this up. Even a lot of our, our students are making new startups after they graduate, they, they continue with this philosophy and they are really making startups around this whole thing. And it's amazing to see that, that, that you feel that like, uh, I've checked the last five years that about 15% of our students have started uh, a kind of startup in this vision uh, or working all in the sustainable thing. And that's really by getting inspired by Francesca and by me and that they are doing this and we are really try make like a very local community of that, of business people. And uh, what, what we typically see now is that, uh, yeah, we are now at a, at a point where we should be able to convince also, yeah, other companies that are really more thinking in a traditional way to upgrade that. That's one thing. Another thing is really, I don't know if this is just a local ecology or if this is also applicable in other environments and maybe with another view and with other things. So I really think this is also quite interesting. The only thing I can tell you is by letting people experiment with things they cannot control. Like for instance, biofabrication. You never can control what will be the outcome that this is really an eye-opener for a lot of people that they say, oh, I never thought I would get control over the system eh? because they always think they have to control every step in the system. But that's not true. You just need to observe the system and be humble about the system and believe in the strength of communities and, and that you create. So, but this would be nice to share, nice to do other experiments and to share this and, and to see how it evolves because we don't know yet. 
Very good. Okay, thank you. Any other closing questions? And then I'll just ask Nicole to say a word or two about her presentation next month. Uh, so she's stepping out of her animator role uh, into uh, her role at Georgian College and uh, sharing some work they're doing there. Any, any final questions for Jan? Okay, Jan, thank you very much. Um, very, very sorry. Uh, please say hello to Francesca for us. And um, we will um, return to the question of how can we bring you together with some other people from the group interested in product. I know Sai is very interested in product particularly, and I think uh, Amdine and, and Simon to some extent. And um, Maya Hofstock, obviously, you've been collaborating with her uh, during this last term on both product and business model design. So uh, I, I think there is a little group interested in seeing what might, how, how we might as a group co uh, contribute to that question uh, that you're now uh, asking. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Jan, very much appreciated. Uh, and uh, Nicole, over to you just for a second uh, to uh, talk about your talk next month on January the 8th, I think it is, Tuesday, January the 8th. Yes, yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Am I got any feedback now? <laughs> no feedback now. <laughs> Um, hi, Jan, that was an amazing presentation. I have so many notes, like just blowing my brain. So thank you uh, with the work you guys have done. Um, yeah, so next uh, month, um, I'm going to attempt to give you guys a presentation about some of the work we're doing in rural social enterprise and flourishing in our ecosystem. Uh, this is very uh, uh, sort of incubating work. Um, but uh, thankfully, Peter Jones has been uh, very gracious enough to, um, and Anthony to guide our neophyteness. And so we're going to present to the community, and we're really looking forward to your feedback on how we're actually breaking apart the, um, the, the flourishing business model canvas and presenting it to our rural uh, community um, who are looking at building social enterprises off of their not for profits as a way of shifting the system in an area where we have uh, a number of complexities, both socially and economically, uh, because we are rural and uh, some of our barriers and resources are quite complex. So how are we tackling that using the, the flourishing uh, business model canvas? And, and hopefully that will lead us to helping us to develop um, a flourishing policy canvas with Peter, as well as you know, how do we adapt the canvas uh, to use it in these types of areas. So that's, the very long version of what we're going to talk about next week. <laughs> so we have a big systems map um, and we would love to hear your feedback, keeping in mind it is graduate work. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so that, that's going to be very interesting. So, so again, again, going from a, um, moving between set to group issue and place, it seems to be something that we're doing a little bit more of in the group between our, our monthly presentation. And uh, I will be, uh, back in Toronto next month. So I'll see you all from Toronto uh, in uh, a few short weeks. Very happy holiday season to everybody uh, and a good end of the year. And uh, look forward to uh, uh, some hopefully exciting news in the first quarter for this group uh, in terms of its evolution. Uh, and uh, stay, stay, stay tuned, as they say. Bye-bye, yeah. everybody. Thank you all very much. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>